And I want to go on to our second speaker, um, who is uh, Dawood Yassim. And I have a little information about him. He spent five summers teaching Arabic language at the Zaituna Summer Arabic Intensive. Dawood has worked with colleagues to establish learning outside of the classroom program at Saituna College, which includes service learning trips and a revival of traditional athletics found in swimming, archery, and horseback riding. That sounds like a lot of fun. Okay, Dawood, you're on. Thank you, Ruth. I begin with the name of uh, Almighty God, the compassionate, the giver of compassion, provider of compassion. Uh, thank you all for, for, for having me. As mentioned, I'm in Berkeley at the top of the hill, if you've ever been to what was the former uh, Lutheran Divinity School or Lutheran Theological, Theological Seminary. Um, that's where our campus is located now. We also have a campus down next to the GTU, the Geological, uh, sorry, the Graduate Theological uh, Union in uh, down in Berkeley. So coming to you, not from, I was amazed this, uh, our guest, she's here from India and just at the top of the hill in Berkeley. So uh, yes, as mentioned, uh, I, um, I'm at Zaytuna College. I'm the Director of Student Life in the Center for Ethical Living and Learning. I've taught Arabic here for some time uh, in, in our summer uh, Arabic program for five years. Um, the topic here, faith and social justice and how our congregations um, uh, you know, kind of bridge these gaps between different political and social uh, justice views. Um, I want to give a bit of um, a little bit of, of, of kind of perspective, as we'll say. Um, I think when we are uh, going to talk about kind of um, how our congregation helps to bridge this, um, I first and foremost think that we have to talk about, okay, well, well, well bridging it would mean that there's some sort of, um, you know, uh, bifurcation that's occurring. Um, uh, there's differences of opinion, and perhaps that leads to argumentation. And those argument, the argumentation would perhaps be uh, what needs to be bridged. So I want to talk about this from this concept of argumentation, and how uh, would a congregation address that issue, and how uh, you know we understand it. When you're looking at Islam, you're dealing probably with what I would like to call uh, principles here. So if we talk about the principle of argument, um, we have to talk about then the response of the principle to argument. And if we're talking about principles, then we also have to talk about it from the perspective of law. Um, Islam is, uh, at times, I like to call it, our community, we, we've, we've become hyper-legalized, so to speak. And I, and I use that term because kind of every aspect of it is returned back to, to law. Um, so if we're talking about that, we're talking about law, let's talk about then uh, uh, something which we call here, which is called, um, uh, let's see if I can get to my next slide. Okay, it's interesting. Okay, so we're here now in something what we call usul fiqh. And fiqh here is actually law, usul, meaning roots is really the word here. So it's really the, 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 the root of 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 the law um, within that there are five aspects really four and a fifth is 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 only considered by one of the legal schools here but how do we understand law in islam we understand the conversation is based on first and foremost the quran and these are in hierarchical order so first a person will look at okay so what does the quran say about a certain topic and then um I think I need to, I just want to break for a moment because my notes are, um, are you able to still see the slide? Are you all able to still see the slide presentation? Yes. But it's, you can see it, it's in a different format now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's why it keeps taking over the, it's interesting because it keeps, uh, Sorry. 
um, here, I think. Um, are you okay if we keep it like that? Just for a moment, I want to keep it like that. So let's talk about this as fiqh for a moment. So really what is it is it's, it's the sources of Islamic law. Okay, so it's it's the discipline uh, dedicated to bringing clarity of relationships to substantive substantive rulings uh, in in this field, and really it's to talk about the nature of, of 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 law, relationship to reason, ethics, and within those are these areas I'm talking about here. The first is the Quran, okay. The second is what's called the Sunnah, and this is based on the practice of the Prophet Muhammad's trans, uh, um, uh, transmission through his sayings, actions, and tacit approval. Tacit approval meaning if he remained uh, silent on an issue and didn't, um, uh, didn't speak about it, that was called, <clears throat> that's how it's, uh, it is described as tacit um, uh, um, um, approval. The next uh, you'll find is called ijma. In ijma, in Arabic, comes from jama'a, which means to get it's a it's a collection. So here, this is the consensus of scholars. So within a time, all scholars would need to agree upon this opinion, and then we have something which is called qiyas or analogical deductions uh, from these three. Um, there are other sources as well, but these are the main four. And as I said, there's a fifth which is um, uh, recognized, uh, which is called Orf. And this is something here, uh, uh, which is, it's pretty much knowledge of a given society. So why is this important to talk about, you know, social justice issues and uh, issues of, um, <clears throat> issues of, uh, you know, politics and other things such as this? The reason why I wanted to mention this is because when you begin to talk about what's happening in the communities, um, many of the Muslim communities are um, uh, 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 have a have a have a, a, a an imam, which would be kind of the the equivalent to the 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 leader of the community, so to speak. Um, and and in a lot of mosques, you find that those leaders are foreign born and trained. And many of the masajid, many of, I'm sorry, mosques are, uh, um, you know, will have a congregation that is, that is immigrant based. So I say that because many then of the rulings that we're talking about with regard to issues of social justice or issues of politics um, are returned back to scholars who don't live in the US and are making rulings based on these categories and then these kind of work their way into the community. Okay, so that's why I wanted to kind of just give us a little background of you know, how we might find you know, uh, 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 the conversation moving inside of, inside of the communities, okay? Um, now, what you do have happening uh, as of late, for example, myself, uh, I'm a convert to the religion, um, but I spent almost 10 years living in the Middle East, studying uh, Islamic law, Arabic, um, and, 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 and spirituality amongst, amongst other things. Um, so you have now indigenous uh, uh, community members um, who are, who are uh, going abroad, learning Islam, coming back, and then assuming positions of leadership uh, within the community where that wasn't the case uh, in the past, okay? And so you have, um, you know, whatever type of, uh, one thing I think is very important about what I said as well with regard to those types of um, rulings that are being issued here is that the political tension that's existed uh, between, uh, you know, uh, American foreign policy and Muslim countries uh, historically has also influenced this uh, scholarly class as well too. And again, now whether that is religious or it's political, that's an entirely different uh, conversation. So if we were to look at this idea of, you know, how does our congregation deal with these, um, uh, uh, you know, two, two sides uh, uh, of a position, um, let's move to, to, to that, for example. So in the Quran, uh, how does your congregation bridge the difference? Okay, so, uh, someone would ask then, okay, so, so what does the Quran have to say about it? Okay, um, so here, this is a verse, uh, chapter 16, verse 125, uh, O Prophet, uh, uh, call people to the way of your Lord with wisdom and good teaching, 
argue with them in the most courteous way. For your Lord knows best who is strayed from, uh, uh, from his way and who is rightly guided. Believers, argue only in the best way with the people of the book. This is referring to those of Abrahamic faiths. Um, and not that it excludes others, but this is the context in which this verse is revealed in. Um, except for those who act unjustly, meaning that you would, you would respond to them uh, uh, not in a way that is not in the best way, but if they are uh, kind of aggressing towards you, it may require a different response, right? Say to them, we believe in what was revealed to us and what was revealed to, to, to you. Our God and your God are the same, and we are devoted to him. And then another verse in the Quran, and say, um, are our gods better? This is a rhetorical question that is being asked here. They raise not the objection save to argument, nay, but they are contentious folks. So the idea that, that um, you know, if this is on the level of religion, the idea that politics, which is seen kind of below uh, 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 one's obligation to, 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 to religion within inside of the communities, um, if this is how one is supposed to, 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 to engage uh, on, on, on this level, then obviously the same type of, of courtesies would be um, you know, uh, enacted within, within a community amongst co-religionists and other people as well too. And I say that because right now um, you are seeing some shifts that are occurring within inside of the Muslim community. You talked about, um, Gaurav, you spoke about uh, Hindus being blue or perhaps the bluest of all. Uh, Muslims are quite blue as well. <laughs> I think, you know, up until this election, about 26% um, of Muslims, and it was 17, then it went 20, uh, 26, and now it's up to 35, are actually Republican. So you're talking that you had 83% and then 74%, and now at about 65% that are, that, are, that are Democrat. Now, the issue that I think happens with points of contention within a progressive um, uh, position of, 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 of the left is that you have contentious social uh, 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 um, positions that seem that oppose uh, its um, uh, legal legal teaching. So, so for example, or religious teaching. So, abortion, for example, would be something. So, you might have a Muslim who is democratic um, leaning, but yet is going to oppose abortion, right? Because now this is something that is that is not permitted within within Islam. There are there are um, exceptions to it when there is permissibility in it, but but as a blanket kind of uh, a, a position, Islam does not uh, uh, condone uh, abortion. So again, this is now something that you would find, and now I brought it back to religion because you know the, the idea is that even if you dif disagree on this point, this is the basis, this is the principle on what you need to return to, because this is what God is legislating to you through the Quran. So many of the, the, the types of disputation or the dis are, it's really a reminding of people of what are the principles, the foundational principles that we stand on as a community. And I think that for the most part, people have been, uh, um, you know, uh, 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 good about, about that. Now, one of the things that I'll say um, that I think really, you know, kind of this affiliation that we're talking about Democrat and, and Republican, I, I don't see that type of um, um, kind of um, um, uh, political loyalty kind of over, over or eclipsing one's um, um, status and position and affiliation within religion. And the reason why I say that is because Muslims are very weird. 2000, you talked about, you know, to, about 20 years ago, 2000, there was a big, it was actually called the push for Bush. And it was a block vote of Muslims in Florida that a lot say, uh, uh, had the opinion, um, you know, in other channels that carried Bush, you know, over Gore in, in, um, in, um, in Florida. And I say that because because again, some of these social, the social um, uh, uh, conservative positions that that, the Dem that that traditionally Republicans have um, was something that 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 is alluring to 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 Muslims. However, uh, you saw then Muslims began to see what is what does that actually look like. So voting is one thing. <laughs> now dealing with the policies and dealing with the aftermath of that of this fiasco that caused the type of refugee status that we're seeing, you know, from that first war and then also the 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 war after that, 
Um, you know, these are things that were, and I don't think it's so much of a left-right discussion because even during the Obama administration, and many of us know I'm African American, so uh, it's not that I'm kind of disparaging on uh, on, on 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 President Obama on anything regarding race or anything such as this, but policies that were absolutely detrimental to the Muslim community as well in terms of the continuation of war, the top types of bombing campaigns that still continued, you know, assassinations, other things such as this that were happening. We'll leave that discussion for another time. But I just want to say that when Muslims look at that, they're not looking to stand behind the party with loyalty saying that, yeah, that's okay, we can kind of uh, go through these things because they contradict our position in our, in, in our, in our, in, in, with us standing in front of God, ultimately. So um, I'm just going to go through two or two, two, two more things here. Um, so we talked about the Quran. The next thing was Sunnah, actions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. And this is where, you know, uh, also with our, uh, the former speaker, he was just saying that, you know, with inside of the community, you might not find that people are kind of at each other's throats or other things such as that. Because uh, again, you're, a, you're constantly being reminded of the, of, of the principles. And again, so here are some principles here, right? No people go astray after being guided, except for that they indulge in argument. So again, this type of, you know, divisiveness that we that we're realizing now, I don't really see that. It is happening to some degree. And I think it's more so shock that people are shocked that Muslims could be supporting Trump or that Muslims could be, and I think that's more of what the response is, um, rather than this kind of you know, uh, rooted, deep uh, historical division uh, that 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 has played out here. Uh, another thing the Prophet Muhammad has said here: "Peace and blessings be upon him." I guarantee a house in the outskirts of paradise for one who abandons arguments, even if he is right. So here, it's not about this position of of, of who's right and dominating. You know, asserting some sort of power. The idea is that we want to have amicable relationships with everyone, and I think this is something right now that so many of us can 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 take heed to. Right, um, kind of uh, in, in the time that we're in, in the time that we're in right now, um, you know. And again, just I, I know we're kind of short on time. And actually, I was, I actually had planned to be out at six. Um, I have to meet my daughter um, um, at Trader Joe's. But um, anyway, just talking about this idea of some, you know, social justice and political views here. You know, really, I think that when we talk about. Um, you know, this idea of social justice or, or political views, that if we talked about a kind of vertical access, that for the most part, Muslims are going to agree on that vertical access. Um, but it's really when we begin to talk about the horizontal access, when we're talking about, you know, uh, rights of others or the subjects that, um, you know, a previous speaker was, was talking about, um, you know, uh, this is something uh, that I think that the discourse for the most part has been, um, 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 tolerable, we'll say, uh, because again, we have this idea that this, these are worldly affairs and, and not to dismiss this in some sort of, you know, we only live for the next world, which is true, but we actually have to live in this world. And what you will find as well too, is that Muslims living in these lands here is that, that Islamic law will say something, but we're also bound by the laws of that land. Now, whether I accept those laws or not, meaning, you know, I, I mean that one has to accept them obviously as the laws of the land. But what I mean by that is whether I personally uh, accept that the position that those laws are for marijuana, for example, would be another one, right? Legalization of marijuana. You know, this is something that's prohibited uh, within with, within Islam. So again, I have to respect it because it's it's a it's the law of the land in which I live in. But uh, but but personally, I don't have to accept that. And I think that's the place where there's kind of this. Um, you know, uh, understanding that yes, we can discuss these, we can disagree, we can be opposed to each other, but at the end of the day, there's a higher reality that all of us have to have to uh, engage in, and I think that's something which keeps the 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 the, the discourse quite civil within our community. Um, and so that's what I wanted to share. Um, you know, and again, as I said, I know we're sorry that we're short on time and kind of, uh, you know, uh, rush through this a little bit, but um, then I'll just, you know, leave you with this for, for a few questions that we can take, but I just say to you, you know, assalamu alaikum, which means peace uh, be upon all of you. Okay, if, if there are questions for Imam Yassim, um, raise your hands. We get to the 
Um, yeah, can you, yeah. There we go. Okay, Christopher has a question, can go. Christopher. You're Hello. muted. Yeah, okay, there we are. Yeah, okay, appreciate the talk. Having uh, been a person who has been on the uh, UC Berkeley campus over the last about three or four years, uh, yeah, I, I have kind of interesting perspective on this. And um, you're, um, I do find it interesting the the movement toward uh, more uh, toward the Republican side. In the, I was not aware that it was that it happened that much. Uh, I'm wondering if a lot of that has to do with the fact that Muslims are reacting to a kind of increasingly militant secularism that we're seeing from the Democratic side. Because I really saw this very directly at Berkeley a couple of years ago when there was a Christian uh, member of the student senate there who really came under very heavy attack simply for express expressing her biblical convictions about marriage between a man and a woman and God creating us male and female. So, uh, and we have some Muslims actually that were, we were kind of supporting the, this lady there. And we had some Muslims kind of join us too, which was neat to, to see. I wonder how, you know, whether we'll see more of that. And I kind of hope that we will, because I think uh, the uh, the threat of secularism is, uh, is a serious threat to people from the standpoint of religious freedom. It'll affect Muslims as well as Christians and others. So, yeah, I'm sure, Christopher, thank you. That's a that's a great point. And I do think that there is absolute truth in that. Um, now, whether, you know, I think what happens is that there's kind of a, there, there, there's a rational kind of um, uh, discourse that's taking place that's saying that, you know, look, if we keep pushing this thing forward and forward and forward and forward and relegating religion to a public space, um, you know, is this the party that we want to have affiliation with, where one can have no conviction uh, that's in opposition to any of these of, of, of these positions, um, and then they intrude upon you know uh, uh, one's uh, a personal space as well too. Um, you know, I have a friend who 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 is a faculty member. Well, his, his he. he his, he is, but his wife is finishing up her PhD at uh, at at UC uh, at UC Berkeley as well too, and she's just talking about this almost like how difficult it is to actually use the restroom now in a way that just feels comfortable to her. But if you bring that up now, it's like you're you know you need to be you know uh, checked, have your have have your intellectual capacity checked, and you know other aspects of your of your ability to 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 live in modern society checked. Now the fear is that okay, well now you're going to run into a republic to 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 a Republican, uh, um, uh, um, you know, party which is racist, which is anti-Muslim, which is you know many things that are said about that. You know, personally, I don't think that that's true, right? But I think that that's the fear that is kind of being pushed, um, you know, uh, to ensure that you know, um, um, you know, this kind of, and again, I, I'm not from here, I'm from the East Coast, right? So this is all new to me in terms of the California, meaning I, I've been here for, you know, eight, eight years, but in terms of the kind of the, the, the left progressive, you know, uh, agenda, obviously Massachusetts is, 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 is similar, but I'd have to say that we're definitely, we're definitely the child and this in California is the parent in terms of how, uh, you know, um, um, liberal politics is played out here on a state, on a state level. So I think there's absolute truth to what you're saying. And I think if we continue moving in to this kind of, you know, um, aggressive, which I would even call this aggressive, you, you know, secularism and this aggressive, you know, atheism that, 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 that is a part of it, that more and more Muslims will begin to move away from this uh, progressive. And I think that is a, is a driving is, is, is a driving factor in that with some of the social um, you know, social conservative positions that I talked about as well, too, around drugs and abortion and, and, and gender and other things such as this. Question? Uh, where is uh, that? Rashma. Rashma? Rashima? Rashma. Hi, sorry. Um, I, I think uh, Imam already answered, uh, you know, the, the question I had. I, I was going to just say that, um, you know, I've, I've lived here, here a long time. And uh, Muslims used to be more Republican back in like my dad, 
back in the 90s because they believed in the small government and uh, family values. You know, they kind of were, I, I, I think the great promise of America is that we should be able to live and let live. You know, if nobody should be able to, I mean, ideally nobody would be pushing your ideas, whether you're very much a religious person or very much a secular person down each other's throat, but that we should all learn to respect and, you know, um, I guess respect and be able to get along and live together. Okay, I, I have a question. Um, uh, one, one of the statements that you had talked about uh, not arguing, that argument was a, not a good thing. And I wondered about how, how do you feel about uh, people having debates on, uh, for example, uh, if, if one person is uh, more democratic in their philosophy and the other is more Republican, is it okay in your religion to debate? Yes, 100%. And I wanted to, you know, hopefully bring some clarity to that. It's not the fact that you that even that argumentation wouldn't happen. What it's saying is don't let it move to a place of divisiveness. And don't let it move to okay. a place where there's enmity. And don't let it be a place where, you know, people are taking up arms against each other over this, right? Or these, yeah. you know, that's, that's more of what it's talking about. Absolutely. And it's actually because this is what we think about is that war really is in conflict is the inability for people to actually argue. Right. So there's this level of frustration and then that occurs because you actually are, 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 are uh, um, you know, superior in your ability to form an argument. And, and, and I don't want to yield to it anymore. So I'm going to be now use force. And that's something that I really think, you know, is, 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 is absolutely problematic. So I think that, that the idea is not just that people won't argue. People will argue, um, but it's to, to argue in a way that is that is that is as we said, it's amicable, right? It's congeniality, there's respect. Um, even if I differ with your opinion, I respect you as a human being and, and your intellectual, like what you used from your logic, from your rhetoric, you know, to, to formulate the idea and then to express it, whether written or spoken or whatever that is, I could disagree with it 100%. But okay. the fact that, you know, it doesn't come to this point where we tear each other down as a, as a result of, uh, of, not, of not being on the same position. That's very helpful. So. Are there any more questions? We have six more minutes before 6.15. I guess not. So uh, let us give Imam Dawood Rashim, Yashim a big hand. Thank you. And next month is December. And we don't do a religion chat in December because people get busy with lots of other things, activities that are going on. And so we'll send you an email about our January event and we hope to see you and tell your friends about it. Be well and happy Thanksgiving and happy Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever you're celebrating. What, what do the Muslims celebrate in December? Do they celebrate something? Well, I wouldn't say they're not something in December per se, um, but the, um, you know, we are, we would just say that you know, the, the beginning of each month is quite a, quite an event for us in that it is the birth of the new moon is something that's really powerful. And so is, is, um, so it's interesting that he was at um, Gurav, forgive my mispronunciation, <laughs> um, but, but he talked about Diwali and this festival of light, yes. but wow. it is something that is, there's a special prayers for that. Um, and, and there's acknowledgement of it, but in the month of December, because it's a lunar calendar, following the lunar calendar, the holidays change and are not set in a certain in a certain month. Imam, does doesn't your name mean new moon? <laughs> Dawood is uh, well. It's interesting because Dawood is not an Arabic uh, word derived. No, but ya from, Yasin, I thought. Oh, Yasin. So yeah. yeah, so Yasin actually. So it's interesting you ask that question. There are certain what they're called haruf al muqatta, the 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 disconnected letters actually in Quran. It's a secret. No one really knows what it is. But however, the verse in it talks about there is a chapter in the Quran called Yasin and it's actually one of the names attributed to the Prophet Muhammad uh, it was the first chapter that I heard of the Quran before it just 
I melted, my heart melted, I just wept. And that's what drew me to, to, to Islam. Uh, there is a, a, a verse in there that talks about, you know, we, 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 the new moon is set, it runs its stations, it disappears and it comes back like, like the, the, the um, date kind of uh, curved bowed leaf. Uh, and then we start the month over again, so yes. Well, we have to wish the Hindus happy Diwali. Happy Diwali, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Take care, everyone. God bless. Thank you very much. See you in January. Bye. Bye-bye. My name is Ruth Gaston. I want to welcome you to Interfaith Interconnects monthly religion chat. So a lot has happened since our last month's meeting. That was the first virtual religion chat we have done. And I thought it went very well. But in the meantime, we have had a national election. And, you know, I was thinking about it. And, and we really have a lot to be proud of. Because in spite of the COVID-19 pandemic, more people voted in this election than in any other election before it. Democracy is in full force. However, <laughs> sadly, we still have uh, great divisions in our country. And um, so, I was um, thinking about what I wanted to say, and I, I, I just want to say that proximity breeds understanding, and distance breeds fear. And what we try to do with Interfaith Interconnect is bring people together. Maybe it's over Zoom and all you can do is see them up to here. But, but we are more together than we are apart. Which brings me to reading our uh, mission statement to enrich, inform, and educate ourselves and others about the great diversity of faiths and cultures in our valley. So today's topic, um, which is the same one we did last month, is extremely relevant given the great division uh, that there is in our country. I will read the topic to you. It's how does your congregation help to bridge the different political or social justice views within it. And we have two speakers, and I am going to read you a little bit about them. The first speaker is Gaurav Rastogi, who is an interfaith Hindu speaker, and he writes and talks about Hindu scriptures bringing the ancient wisdom into practical language that can be applied to anyone interested in living deeply. So Gaurav, you're on. Namaskar, thank you, Ruth. And um, hello to everyone, each one of my friends here. So good to see everyone. Are you able to hear me? Yeah. Affirmative. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I wanted to begin with a prayer for this season. Uh, it's that time of the year. Um, it's November, and each uh, day is, of course, now shorter, and each night is longer. And as the shadows extend, we reach for the light that guides us. This weekend is the first moonless uh, night, night of the season, this Saturday. And we celebrate in the Hindu tradition, uh, Diwali, which is a celebration uh, uh, of the light within as well as the, it's the festival of lights. We celebrate by lighting um, um, candles, but they're, they're made, they're, well, they're, all, they're, they're not wax candles, but here we use wax candles, but essentially lay out lights in a, in a sequence. 
and uh, and just like a chain around the house and uh, celebrate the darkest night of the year with lights. Uh, we call it Diwali and it's a time for rebirth. And it is also a time for, to think about the meaning of material life itself. And so I wanted to chant for you this famous Upanishad. It's a verse from Hindu scripture. Uh, it's one of the oldest scriptures. This is the Brihad Aranaka Upanishad, which is the great wilderness lectures. And I'm going to chant it for you. So um, it does, it's, uh, I'll, I'll also describe the meaning later so you're able to follow along. For now, just sit comfortably in any posture. You can sit as you're sitting, but sit with your back straight, your back, neck and head in a straight line. Close your eyes gently and relax the expression on the face. Relax your shoulders. Relax your belly. Now bring all your attention into the belly. As you inhale, let the belly expand. As you exhale, let go. Inhaling into the belly. And as you exhale, let go of all your thoughts, all preoccupations, any concerns that you worked in with. Just let everything go. Breathing into the belly, let the belly expand. Breathing out, simply let go. I'm going to chant Om once, then I'll chant the, the uh, verse, then I'll describe the meaning to you. You can keep your eyes closed. Oh. Asatoma sat gamaya Tamasoma joter gamaya Mrityorma mritam gamaya Om shanti 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 In English, this is translated as from untruth lead us to truth, from darkness, lead us to light, from death, lead us to immortality. Om, peace, peace, peace. And welcome to today's conversation. Uh, the topic today is really interesting. I had a lot of uh, fun researching it and just collating my thoughts because uh, I was looking for something that makes it a compelling story and something that is uh, enjoyable to hear. And uh, what's enjoyable if there's no di disagreements or differences of opinion. The topic today is how does your congregation help to bridge the different political or social justice views within it? And, uh, and so using the, uh, the idea of social justice, I went back to read up on what social justice issues we really do care about these days. And four stood out as things that we, there, there's a lot of conversation within the community, uh, the wider community here in the US about it. And um, why not think about how the Hindus are thinking about it and what, if any, are the differences of opinion within the broader Hindu community on these issues. So the four issues that, the social justice issues that I'm gonna talk about are climate justice, which is of course, yeah, includes um, um, you know, um, you know uh, being aware of the environment, uh, ecological uh, 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 action, as well as the fact that third world countries and poorer people will be more directly impacted by the climate change. And so climate justice is really about um, balancing that. So climate justice is a hot issue. Uh, pun unintended, it just came to me, I apologize. <laughs> the second is uh, transgender and LGBTQ plus issues, which is dealing with uh, you know issues of homosexuality as well as transgenders. The third is refugees, which is an issue of, of tremendous concern, of course. Uh, and, and the fourth is a social justice and specific to Hinduism, of course, 
uh, I would be remiss if I don't talk about the caste system because everyone wants to hear that anyway. So we'll cover that. Uh, let's begin with climate justice. And I notice uh, there's A. Salman Khan on this call, which is fantastic. Sir, I'm not referring to you in this story. I'll tell you a story. So 20 years ago, um, this uh, famous movie star, uh, Salman Khan, not the gentleman on this call, by the way. Uh, so Salman Khan is one of the three or four big Khans that are famous actors in, in, in India. Their movies come out, they sell, they sell out. They, it's the equivalent of launching their your movie on Thanksgiving or Christmas, the movies sell out. Super uh, famous movie stars. So he's out in the Indian deserts, which is also in India on the west side of India. And um, he goes out hunting, hunting because it's apparently what one does. He goes out hunting um, deer locally. And as he's out hunting deer uh, day one, day two, day three, day three, he, uh, he, 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 he hits a, a deer, which isn't an ordinary deer. This is a black buck. And it's an Indian antelope, very beautiful looking uh, creature. It's on the endangered species uh, list because They've been hunted out of extinction. It's uh, you know unique to India, but uh, in Texas you might find a few black bucks as well. They're beautiful looking creatures. So anyway, Salman Khan uh, allegedly is out in a jeep uh, and he shoots a black buck. But next thing you know, three men on a motorcycle come by and they gave chase. And they they try to catch them. They don't they don't catch up. Eventually, they take the number of the the jeep and they register a police case. And uh, what's interesting about the three men on the bike was well, they were not just ordinary, regular villagers. They were regular villagers, but there was nothing ordinary about them. The interesting thing about them was um, they were part of a Hindu sect uh, called the Bishnois. Bishnois literally means the 29ers. Think of it as 2-9. And this sect has 29 rules that their founder gave them about 500 years ago. And they're all about eco-conservation because they're in a desert, eco-conservation is a big thing. And the black book is extremely dear to this community. So dear that they raise black book children just like their own children. If you look at, you know, look up the, on the internet, you'll see women that are feeding child on one side, black buck on the other side, both uh, uh, sucking at the teeth. So they, they're really fond of the black bucks. They treat them as divinity. And for them, any, any tree being cut or any black buck being, being uh, uh, injured is, um, is, is, is terrible. And so these poor villagers against the might of India's you know, reigning movie star um, is a story that a movie should be made about, but wouldn't be. These guys then register a case and as you'd expect, money wins even in India. So, so they lose the case, they fight at the higher court and higher court, 20 years elapsed. And they go all the way, eventually the high court says, look, eh. there's no proof that the bullet that killed the black buck came from this guy's gun. It sounds like a cop out, but the point was that they pursued the case. And finally, I think he has a, you know, he has a, 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 a jail term waiting for him at some point in the future. The point is there is a sect of Hinduism that actually is, um, is, um, is, a, is a very strong eco-conservationist, but they're not alone. Um, there's another community in the Northern parts of India where if you've heard the term tree hugger, uh, the term tree hugger originally comes from these people where uh, the mountains were being eroded, the forests were being cut and a company that makes tennis rackets in the 1970s for, for sale here uh, had, the te had a contract to cut 300 trees. And these, uh, the women in this community decided we're not having any of this. So they tie themselves to the trees. So it's called Chipko Andolan. And there are these very moving pictures of poor village women uh, who, are, who are essentially tied to the tree because they're not going to let the trees get cut. The trees did not get cut. The movement and the trees both survived. And ecofeminism is a big deal uh, in that. But neither of these are actually unique to you, you know, some quirky sects of poor Hindu people um, at all. Hindus in general tend to be uh, eco-conservationist. Uh, when we do our prayers, we, um, 
we tend to uh, um, pray to all the five elements. And in that sense, uh, there's a very active interest in eco-conservation. And so within the Hindu community on the social justice issues, there's really not much uh, range of differences of opinion where one sect says, you know, drill baby drill and the other sect says, no, no, no cutting trees. Generally speaking, Hindus are, tend to be um, on the uh, progressive end of, of the eco-conservation side uh, when it comes to protecting the environment. And so that's one story which I thought was interesting. Uh, let's talk about um, um, uh, homosexuality. So it turns out uh, India, inherit, India and a lot of uh, British colonies inherited British common law and British law in general. So if you look up section 377, it's common to all these countries where all their civic laws have a section 377, which in the 1800s, Victorian morality, of course, they outlawed homosexuality. And, uh, and the same here, Victorian morality is, is all over. And in 2018, uh, the courts finally struck down this as being illegal and because it's of course illogical. So um, the decriminalization of homosexual relations is, um, is a very touchy subject. And I remember, and by the way, everything that you do with the Hindus, thanks to the overwhelming impact of Bollywood, uh, the coping mechanism for everything in India is that you make a movie about it. So there used to be movies poking fun at um, homosexuality. In a light, these are rom-coms or bro-coms in the sense that it's just the nudge, nudge, wink, 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 wink kind of thing. So when this outlawing, when the 377, section 377 was canceled, the way the Hindu uh, community reacted was a lot of silence. You know, the religious community wasn't out putting out edicts saying, no, no, this is ridiculous. It's a crime against uh, God. There's none of that system in the Hindu tradition. Uh, there's been a lot of acceptance. And of course, as you'd expect, a coping mechanism is, now there are other comedy movies made about homosexuality, but in a different way, not the nudge, nudge, wink, wink of 20 years ago. Uh, there is some controversy within the Hindu tradition, quasi controversy on whether the Marriage itself uh, is something that um, that should be done in a religious framework or a civil framework, and and some people say that there's no need for a religious framework for marriage because that's to have children. Uh, you should have a, a marriage for civil, uh, you know, for property rights and insurance purposes and so on. That's all legit, but on the uh, the uh, religious side is probably not required because you're not going to have kids from that union. You can, of course, adopt. So within the Hindu tradition on homosexuality, there has been broader acceptance. On LGBTQ+, that's quite interesting because Hinduism in general has been non-binary uh, from the inception. So we, we do recognize a third gender. Uh, we've always recognized a third gender. And, and what's happened now is as we are letting go of the British sort of Victorian era rules and, and laws, uh, there's a broader acceptance of third gender people within the Hindu community. Uh, they, uh, in fact, recently, the, uh, one of the states in India uh, launched a, a metro station, which is now called Rainbow, Rainbow Station. And it's, of course, it's celebrating uh, the third gender. And there's a whole university that's been created just for um, people that are of the third gender, uh, because previously they were not able to get jobs or they were not able to get uh, education and employment. So in general, there's acceptance of homosexuality as well as um, LGBTQ plus uh, issues. There's of course cultural pushback as you can well imagine that culturally it's not accepted, but younger, more modern people are accepting of it. And it's all, uh, all um, um, there's no religious uh, sort of problem with it in, in that sense. So let's come to the next issue, which is the issue of refugees, which isn't a modern issue by any means. And uh, Hindus in general have been accepting of other traditions. So Hindus, uh, the broader region of India has been accepting uh, persecuted people for you know, thousands of years. So there have been, uh, there are Jewish people from 2,500 years ago. Uh, all over India, there are very interestingly in the northeast part, like super remote part of India, in the in the mountains, there's a community that 
realized only lately, about 70 years ago, that their tradition was oddly Jewish. And then they, they checked with people in Israel and they found out that, yeah, well, you check out and you're probably one of the last tribes uh, uh, of, of uh, you know, Jewish people. And so they were inducted and there, some people have moved to Israel. Many, of course, live in India. So Jewish people have been in India for about 2,500 years. Uh, out of Iran, um, the Zoroastrian people moved about six to 700 years and were given uh, you know, land and, and uh, respect, and of course, continue to thrive. Very active community, uh, small, but very active community. Um, the uh, St. Thomas, of course, the Doughton Thomas, uh, St. Thomas is quite interesting. Uh, the early Christians in India trace back to St. Thomas and his ministry. So they're Syrian Christians and they've been around for 2000 years as well. So in general, there's a broad acceptance of refugees in the Indian tradition. Uh, more recently, India um, uh, uh, created a law to, to fast track religious, per, religiously persecuted minorities from neighboring countries. That way uh, they have an access to, for example, so example, Sikh people from Afghanistan who were fleeing, you know, the remaining Sikh people, they just moved to India and they were given um, access. There is a, some degree of controversy with the previously Bangladeshi refugees, which uh, don't come anymore because Bangladesh is actually doing really well economically. Uh, and now with Rohingya refugees, which are going into all countries, including India around because of the troubles in, in Burma, there is some degree of economic pushback, but it's, the, you know, it's, it's everywhere. Now let's talk about the big elephant in the room, uh, which is the last issue I'm gonna talk about, which is the caste system. Now the, the caste system, the word caste itself, of course, is Portuguese, uh, casta from, from purity. And the European people uh, had strange purity uh, laws. They had very class-based system. The 1% would only marry from within each other and everybody else was either a serf or a landowner or whatever. So when they came to India, the same genius minds that came to, to America and called the Native Americans as Indians, the same geniuses came, went to India and said, okay, we have to figure out a way to make sense of these people. And they reinvented a, a new system and gave it, called it caste system. Now, don't get me wrong. India is a really old society and the Hindus in general, are like every other community, are very class conscious. Add to it, the occupational uh, 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 tradition, which is within the community. Uh, for example, weavers, uh, the sons of weavers are weavers, the sons of archers are archers, the sons of smiths are smiths, the sons of rights are rights. These are English last names, but you get the idea. Occupational communities tended to pass their occupation down. And if your community is lower in the social pecking order, then there's a lot of, social order issues that, that come out of that. And so the British invented a caste system out of this occupational community uh, thing. Over the last, uh, I guess, few decades, Hindus have been trying to get rid of it. Caste system exists not merely in the Hindu tradition, all other communities in India. You know, Christians have caste in India, uh, Islamic Muslim people have caste in India as well. There's a lot, uh, because again, Racism and classism is, 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 is prevalent everywhere. It's not a core part of the Hindu tradition. And what the Hindus have been trying to do is get rid of it uh, in many different ways. One interesting way is, um, is reservation. So uh, a lot of jobs, uh, education as well as jobs, 50 to 70% of positions are reserved for people from uh, certain communities. And, and um, and that's one way. The other is because of these incentives to, to people from uh, downtrodden communities, the pressure is now reverse. And now people that were previously classified as higher end communities are now trying to uh, politically sort of come around and be assigned a lower denomination so that they're able to get those reservations for education as well as jobs. So it's an interesting dynamic that's going on. Within the Hindu tradition, for example, here, you know, at the Livermore Temple or any other temple, we don't, uh, we don't know, I mean, everyone's welcome. They don't need to be Hindu to, to come in. In general, when we're here, we have no idea what anyone's caste is. No one's ever asked me. I've never asked anyone. And, and here, it's not as if 
we are interested in retaining those distinctions that in classes that exist. Uh, so that's really the only controversial part that I could find within the Hindu tradition. So four issues that I've talked about, climate justice, I've told you the story of uh, eco-conservation, um, homosexuality, I've talked to you about section 377 and the transgenders, refugees, I've talked about the sort of broad tradition of ref refugees and the caste system, of course, I've covered a little bit about. So that's the range of social justice issues and the, the dis differences of opinion within the Hindu tradition that exist. Uh, by the way, on the caste system, one of the big things that you might have heard of is that there's a priestly class and there's a, you know people that are untouchables. Over the last couple of decades, there's been a lot of um, investment by Hindu uh, sort of reformist and just Hindu organizations. Uh, over the last, I think, five years, 5,000 people from untouchable communities, we don't use that word, untouchability is a crime in India. Um, they So 5,000 people have been trained to be priests and uh, they can now serve in temples and they're certified and, you know, and so on. So there's that degree of reformation that's going on and that has broad acceptance as well. So that was the talk. That's the broad range of Hindu perspectives on social justice issues. I'd be happy to take any more questions in the couple of minutes we have remaining. Ruth, I turn it back to you. You're on mute, of course. Yeah, and uh, am I not on mute now? Yes. Okay, good. So um, questions for Gaurav. Just raise your hand on the um, chat and we'll call on you. So we have to get back to the all the people, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. And if you don't know how to raise your hand, you can just unmute and start talking. Did you hear that? <laughs> yeah, we got that. Rob, I have a question. Yes, hey, Mom. Hi. How are you, sir? Hello. You mentioned about uh, an effort to, uh, or yeah, efforts to kind of uh, end, or effort, yeah, efforts to end the caste system. Uh, what does end goal look like in that? Right. What? What? So, so it's one as it right. So, so we talk about a, a telios, right? So at the end. What would that? What would that look like? What would it bring? India too, as a as a country, and you mentioned that from the Portuguese uh, roots, is is it is it solely from that, or is there an aspect? I think you did say that there is also a, a, a kind of a class system that exists within inside of uh, you know the hierarchical system that exists inside of, of Hinduism as well too. Correct? Sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, the uh, what's happening now is uh, uh, so there's a lot of of course vote bank politics that India is a thriving democracy, and the interesting thing there is. There's been a lot of vote banking where you, you sort of, you make a little Venn diagram, then you make a smaller circle and you own that circle that somebody else makes a smaller, yet smaller circle inside. So there's a lot of social justice issues that uh, masquerade or that are over, overwhelmed by, by uh, these vote bank politics. And the big drive there is you can't really govern by vote banking. Uh, smaller bits. So you're going to have to look for issues that everyone's interested in. So politically, what I see happening is there's been a drive to create broader platforms around the economy, for example. So India's made, what, 120 million, 110 million toilets uh, because people didn't have toilets, for example. Uh, and so just bread and butter issues so that people are more interested in those instead of, you know, who their community is and what their neighbor is because those issues are not germane to a modern society. And that's what's going on on that front. The emphasis on education has definitely been a, a big deal where if you look at the IT people that come from India um, off late, right? I mean, I came as part of that boom, so I can speak for uh, that. Uh, no one really cares what community you're from. You've done your engineering, you're in IT, go get your thing. But what happens with that is each one person that's in the IT business, for example, feeds 10 other people in the community because the whole community gains out of that. And that changes the dynamic. So there's a lot more interest in engineering, for example, as a career option, because you can go past, you can leapfrog 
you know, hundreds of years of subjugation by just, you know, four years of engineering. And that's been a big change. And now, of course, other occupations as well. So I think broadly the end goal is, is really, look, uh, is to get to a point where people are focused on economic development and cultural and spiritual development instead of uh, being in a sort of regressive medieval mindset because that's not helping anyone in that sense. Smaller divisions are not going to help uh, all of us pull together. Yes, Ruth. Um, I'm interested in uh, your education system. Is uh, education free for everybody or do people uh, who are rich get better education than people who are middle class or poor? How does it work? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I have to tell you the education system in India is, is terrible. <laughs> I say, say that with no sense of irony because I'm here as a result of that, but I'm, I'm an exception to that. Uh, the education system in India was designed by the British to create civil servants, so clerks, people who could write and scribe, uh, not thinking, not, not liberal arts, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, civic leaders kind of thing. So it's a, it's a system that's designed for rote learning, repetition, and mastery of memorization of facts rather than an ability to, 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 to think and reason and argue. Uh, and that's been a problem. That's one problem. Now your question is, do rich people go to better schools? Yeah, I went to a Christian school uh, because of course those are private schools and I, I have I've had a Christian education all through my, my, my schooling as a result of that. Um, so yeah, uh, rich people do go to private schools. Private schools are, of course, they charge more and they're better. Uh, public schools are getting better. So there's a sort of left-leaning socialist type government in Delhi, which is the city I grew up in. And they're doing a lot of investment into improving the quality of public schooling, which uh, I don't, well, I should say public schools, when they say public school in India, it, those are private schools. Government schools are public schools, but never mind. So, so public schooling is generally low quality, but they're trying to improve it. Paucity of teachers is a problem huge country, you can't, and lots of young people, you don't have enough good quality teachers because everyone's a product of the same rote learning system that came by. Higher education, however, is actually good in India. And, I, and it's super cheap. I, I did my entire engineering in the equivalent of, let me see, $70 over four years is probably all I paid. And uh, it's highly subsidized. Um, you could pay for private, but public education is very cheap. I did my MBA at India's number one program for maybe a thousand dollars of modern money. It wasn't expensive. And, uh, and that's the relic of the socialist uh, sort of economy that India had been for the longest time. Now there are private uh, education institutions and a, a lot of kids come here to the US for their masters because they really wanna get a better, longer sort of deeper education. The poor people in general, Ruth, your question is, poor people do not have access to high quality education. They have access to government education, which is free, but um, no, they can. It's, it's, not, it's not really a great quality. Okay, so uh, Rashma, has, did I say that correctly? She has her yes. hand up. Okay, so you're gonna go and then John and Wendy. Um, hello, thank you so much for your, the information. Um, Sorry, I'm trying to see who's talking uh, so I can actually look at your face. Sorry. Hold on, let me, let me, uh, let me see if I can, un uh, <laughs> hold, up. hold on, let me just see if I can do that. I can oh, Reshma, yes. Hey, Reshma. Hi, yes, I see you. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was, so I, I'm a Muslim from India. I didn't realize we had a caste system, so that we, I thought that was one of the, you know, um, I think it, what may, may have happened is that we, the Muslims that converted from Hinduism may have absorbed it, but theoretically, at least, Islam doesn't recognize the caste system, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree, that's the theory, but I think it's a cultural system more than it is anything. If you go to matrimony sites, even in Pakistan, which is, you know, Islamic well, state, you're yeah. going to see a lot of that. I think you it's know just that yeah, it's a really racism because usually when you go to matrimony sites, it's usually are you fair and slim and what? Totally, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, and for example, if you speak English in India with a particular accent, then you're higher order human than someone who speaks with an accent because then you're you know lesser species of humanity, I guess. So there's a lot of you know classism that goes on in India. Every community has that. Yeah. Uh, John and Wendy. Where's the other one? There I am. Okay, I'm back. I got down to mute. Um, so my question is, um, all this is wonderful, and thank you very much for all this information. Um, my question is more on a microcosm level is the Within my own congregation, we have quite an, an Episcopalian a Christian. Um, we have quite some very big differences politically um, and maybe even faith-wise. Um, so how do, in, in your congregation, how do you deal with those huge differences between yeah. people and yeah, that's an interesting question because it turns out, so Hindus in general are not congregational, I should, I hasten to add. So it's not that the, this temple in, in Livermore is, is, we can go to any temple, we go to all the temples. So I speak for the broader American Hindu uh, uh, population here. Um, politically, it's been quite interesting where Hindus in general uh, uh, skew highly democrat uh, democratic. And uh, till a few years ago, it was odd. You'd see a few people out on the East Coast that skewed Republican and, uh, and, and people didn't know what to deal with that. Uh, what's happened off late is that the, the, the sort of locus is shifting a little. Hindus are skewing somewhat, uh, uh, still overwhelmingly blue, but more people are, are leaning Republican depending on who they are and what they are. A lot of that is just what media they're watching, what kind of people they're following or what issues they care for. So if you see, um, if you see the, the Trump government, a lot of uh, his, you know, his, the people that worked for him were Indian people. Uh, and, uh, and so you see that and you see a lot of uh, sort of swing. How Hindus are dealing with this red versus blue polarization is uh, we don't talk about it at the temple. Because we're not congregational, we don't have to see each other's face ever. We don't have to, you know, we don't go to the temple on Sundays or Tuesdays and say, you, you sir are doing this or that. We just don't. So because we don't have to see each other, there's really not that much argumentation. You can do your own thing and uh, run your own uh, platform. And it doesn't invite as much uh, trouble. You can meet each other for festivals and it, it, there's not much issues there. Debates don't happen within the community, which is part of the challenge where of organizing Hindu voters because how do you tell them where to vote? They're gonna vote whichever the way they individually feel. Um, and that's just how this community is organized. But politically, uh, overwhelmingly Democrat now beginning to shift a little bit uh, to the, if you look at political uh, leanings, the Hindus tended to be the most blue of all communities in the U.S. So you just outright like majority blue, but that is shifting a little, as you'll see also with the Latinos that are shifting a little towards Republican, a certain type of Latinos, for example. So that's the interesting shift, but it hasn't created a schism in the community, if that's your question. It's not as if people are screaming at each other and, uh, and are vilifying each other. That hasn't happened because we don't see each other at the temple. Okay, so we have time for one more question, and that's uh, Santi. We had her hand up for a while. So Santi, there you go. Yeah, there. Hey, Santi. Hi. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Yeah, I'm in India now, so it's six seven o'clock in the morning. So I just wanted to share along with Gaurav's thought. I mean, uh, speech on education. So. The one huge difference I see uh, education in India and U.S. is there is not much of caste difference from public to private schools. And, uh, in fact, and also uh, my medical education, he finished his engineering in, uh, you finished engineering in $70. My whole uh, medical education finished in $200. Yeah. Versus $350,000 in US, right? So we came to like, no, yeah, to 
improve my skills, I came abroad, but I'm back to India to serve my community also here. So I think education is a huge cost in US, but in India also compared to the time I did my uh, undergrad and postgrad medicine, now it's become uh, a little more uh, expensive, but as such education is, um, not that expensive compared to uh, Western countries, even in private schools. And I had studied in private schools mostly, but uh, just on merit basis, my father gets admission. I don't pay extra fees. Yeah, so that's my uh, input. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I'm going to uh, end Gaurav's time and uh, thank you. Go, uh, and, and I, I want to say thank you very much and I'm going to clap. Thank you, Gaurav. <laughs>